sure all of you absolutely have no idea who I am, and for good reason. My name's Connor. I am new to the in-thinking community. Uh, I've had an absolute blast this last week and this weekend getting to know all or most of you sitting in the room now. Uh, the person I have the pleasure of introducing is a truly knowledgeable and understanding individual, or thinking human, if you will. When I was given this task, I immediately started scheming up some sort of introductory gimmick that I could play. I came up with two truths and a lie, but as it turns out, the truth is much more interesting than any lie I could come up with. Mike here offers an interesting perspective that most cannot. He's had a wonderful opportunity of traveling the globe, working for various organizations that exhibit characteristics of the prevailing style of management, through production viewed as a system and beyond. I forgot where I'm at. And by the way, he races motorcycles all over the United States. Another interesting thing. Yeah. <laughs> Without completely ruining his presentation, this, by what method, please help me welcome Mr. Mike Beck. All right, everybody. Um, in thinking together, so we're supposed to think together. This is not a skewing one direction. So uh, this is going to be very uh, open to comments and questions at any time. Okay. By what method? The reason I chose that, it was uh, as I thought about uh, what to talk about here. The last maybe a little more than a year ago, and thinking about things that I recall from a time of Demi, he just stressed that point so much. It was, his concern at the time was prevailing style of management and management by objective and all the harm that was coming from that. And the idea of a numerical goal by itself uh, is nonsense. You, it only makes sense with a method. And so I wanted to talk about that concept. And uh, is anybody in the room, were, were you part of the ongoing discussion in March? I presented a paper, uh, the white paper on this as well. Anybody here participate? No, I missed it. No, nobody did. So um, I was hoping there'd be one or two folks uh, who, who participated in that. You had a good attendance. Um, during that talk, I went through all the reasons not to do MBO. And this talk, I'm going to assume most of us would have a, a reason, a good understanding of why not to do that. And I'm going to offer perhaps some ideas of what to do instead. So that's what this is going to be about. So context is really, really important. And I'm going to start by sharing a little bit more about my background because I bring a lot of personal bias. Okay? And it's important to be upfront to share with you. I've got a lot of personal bias. I'll tell you why I have it. And um, so you'll learn a bit more about me. Also for context, is it, I'll, I'll spend some time spending these contributions. Um, organization view of the system and SOPK, which we've heard quite a bit about. But that's more context. And then I also want to frame this leadership management uh, uh, reference point. So that's a little bit of introduction. Then we're going to get into taking all that. What are some principles? And what was Toyota's interpretation on all of this? So with that as a, as a high level introduction, I'm going to jump right in. So context, first of all, I had the amazing uh, luck of having just been in the right place at the right time for a long time. I've had a really great uh, opportunity to learn a lot of things. I started my career um, in automotive, and I was at General Motors. And uh, Vince, who's going to be talking tomorrow, uh, he and I have talked a couple times and didn't realize that we were there at the same time and uh, knew a lot of the same people. That was interesting. Too. And um, GM was really good to me. I started off with a, an engineering degree. I was a design engineer. And they, uh, they saw something in me, and I got a GM fellowship, and they sent me for a master's degree and paid for that. I came back and uh, had, a, had a really good job. Met Dr. Deming for the first time in 1984 at a Deming 40 seminar, uh, and that set me off on a new path. Um, Ended up at Toyota and then uh, had, had, a, had some uh, activity in industrial, UTC, at Ford, Paris, uh, spent time in engineering, quality and CI. CI, I'm missing from you. Continual improvement. Continual improvement. And the reason for that is because I'm interested in both continuous 
and this continuous improvement. The concept of continuous is you know smooth function, and discontinuous allows for jumps in improvement, which are called innovations. So uh, continuous improvement. And uh, most recently consulting. My GM time, I was really proud of this that I put up here. I, I worked on an engine and was a lead guy in the development of a new product, and uh, I, I learned a lot from that. Um, and it was sort of individual contributor moving into a in team leader kind of role. And that's where I was able, as I mentioned, to, uh, to see Dr. Deming, got really interested in a lot of things I learned from him. As a result of that 1984 seminar, I really like the statistical part of this stuff. I went off and I got a four-week uh, course in Taguchi methods and then applied a lot of that and uh, uh, got known as somebody who's getting stuff done this way. And then one of these lucky strokes of, uh, you know, just the right place at the right time, uh, a gentleman named Art Mueller, who was the uh, vice president of the division of GM that I worked for, uh, which was I had moved from Oldsmobile to GM powertrain while still doing the same job, all kinds of reorganizations happened around me. Uh, he engaged Dr. Deming to be the, um, basically the, the uh, consultant for the division for quality and continuous improvement. I couldn't jump to the front line fast enough. What can I do to work with this guy? And I was given the opportunity to become one of the very few people, there's about six of us, who were selected to be the, become internal consultants for change and, and transformation. Um, worked with Gypsy Ranny, who many of you know from, from this uh, forum and others, and uh, really changed my career went, you know, from engineering completely into the continuous improvement stuff. And I was so fortunate I was the guy that picked up Dr. Deming at the airport and took him to uh, the meeting. And it turned out what my role really was, um, I was the translator. Because Dr. Deming would uh, be in a meeting with all these GM executives, and I was this pretty young guy, about kind of days of running around and talking to these, uh, these uh, people who were you know, five levels above my pay grade. And they'd be talking in all kinds of acronyms and talking about programs and projects and such. And Dr. Deming didn't know what the heck they were talking about. So I said, really, I wouldn't know a heck of a lot. That was, that was great. Um, I had a really, really excellent time at GM. They paid for another statistic, uh, another degree for me. I got a um, master's in statistics while I was there. Wonderful. Fast forward, Dr. Deming died. A bunch of things changed at GM, and it went from, I was in a blue pen environment, and it devolved to a red pen larger environment, and I decided it wasn't the right place to be anymore. And I took this, right, very short term, I, I went to do continuous improvement in healthcare. And as soon as I left, I got contacted by somebody recruiting for this great opportunity at Toyota, which I went to next. And so this next period of time, Toyota, I had the wonderful experience of taking all the, all the knowledge I had from the Deming experience and living it in this other environment. And really, really learned a lot. And the key things I took away there, I understood new product development in a new way. I understood Toyota's production system, which I'm going to share my views of the relationship between Deming and, and Toyota, and strategy deployment as a key tool that I'll also talk a little bit about. Since uh, that time, I've had numerous executive roles, and it looks like I might be you know, living one of the deadly diseases we're having with job hopping and management tenants. And frankly, there were some good reasons and some less good reasons, but they were real reasons. And I feel good about all those transitions, believe it or not. I don't want to go through all the detail. And for the last um, few years, I have been uh, working and consulting and uh, having opportunities to apply this uh, way of thinking in a number of organizations. And most recently in healthcare, the last year and a half or so, I've been back in healthcare and I'm um, trying to help transform the, uh, the healthcare uh, system we have, which, uh, anybody here work in healthcare? Yes, yes. It's amazing uh, how much opportunity slash problem there are. Uh, and it's also amazing how big it is. The healthcare spending in the United States, just that amount of money, if it were a GDP, was our country and it was a GDP, it would be right between Great Britain and France. It's between those two countries in that 
magnitude to go on. So it's amazing uh, how big that is. So that's, I bring lots of both good stories, but also uh, bias to what I'm going to share with you. Other context. So page four, about the crisis. Demi's view of the organization as a system. And um, everyone here has seen this. The key points that relate to what I'm trying to say is that, first of all, you've got the view of an organization as a system with an aim. And the aim is required for it to be a system. And without an aim, it would be you know, a set of flows. Why is an aim necessary for it to be a system? Any ideas? What was Dr. Demi talking about? Definition of system is a collection of um, people and, and equipment and what have you to execute a, a, a purpose. Yeah, it has to have a purpose for it to be a system. And the, the definition of a system is something which is cohesive, right? And the idea of an aim provides an objective, a, a direction. And the reason that's important is because if we want to do improvement, we're going to have to make a change, right? So to be an improvement, you must have a change. But not all change is an improvement. So an improvement is change that moves the output, the, the results from the system more in the direction of the aim or closer to the aim. Okay? That's a key idea. And the other key point related to what I'm going to talk about is the stuff at the bottom. It says tests of processes, machines, methods, costs. That's an interesting word to get you. It's tests. Tests of. So any ideas what that's all about? What, what is that? Verification and validation. Verification, validation. Say it again. Assessment. Mm -hmm. Confirmation mm -hmm. of repeatability. Confirmation of repeatability. And a bit of actual learning. And some learning. Right. Confirmation of the method in addition to confirmation of the output. Did we do what we intended to do? Yes. And was the output what we intended to do? Absolutely. Absolutely. Both the method and the output test right. results. Right. So we're talking about your leadership. Aspire, inspire, achieve. We also have talked about management. Does that, sound, what we just talked about, sound more in the realm of leadership or more in the realm of management? Probably both. I think probably both is the right answer. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's more context. <coughs> Additional context. The next view, the demi system of profound knowledge. And we've talked about this. Appreciation for a system, theory of variation, theory of knowledge, theory of psychology. If we want to answer the question, by what method? If we have an aim, we have an objective, we know where we want to go, and the MBO, the Management by Objective idea, is that the leader does what? Just says, yeah, yeah, I think we ought to do that, right? Pick a, pick a goal. And then there's generally a measure of those events, right? There's a, a numerical goal and target. Just by itself, no method, how are you going to do it? All right, so we're going to design some methods. Methods need to take into account these dynamics of the organization you as a system, right? So we have to design with some principles that recognize the interrelationship between these pieces, all leading towards that aim. So that, that's all context for what we're going to talk about with regard to this by one method. Okay, so what's the job of a leader? The job of a leader. Okay, back to the economic page one right here. It's to accomplish the transformation of the organization. How many he accomplish? First he has theory. He understands why we bring aim to the organization to help people. Second, he feels compelled to accomplish the transformation as an obligation to himself and his organization. Third, he has a practical aim. He has a plan, step by step. So we have to get this 
something concrete, really concrete, step by step. What are we talking about here? How would we do it? And this idea of by what method, Dr. Deming was saying, you got to actually get down to the nitty gritty detail. What are you going to do? Who's going to do it? How will they know what to do? How will you teach people that need to understand what they should do? There's all kinds of important things to think about with regard to the job of a leader. So leadership. We're talking about leadership. Leadership management. We just saw John's view. There was, there's a you know, left and right hand side there of leadership and management. And uh, I've learned a lot by reading Warren Bennett. Here's a quote from On Becoming a Leader. Warren Bennett's on leadership. Leadership is often confused with other things, specifically management. But management requires entirely different skills. As Bennett sees it, leadership revolves around vision, ideas, direction, has more to do with inspiring people than with day to day implementation. I agree with that. I mean, not agree with that. It all makes sense. One can't lead unless he can leverage more than his own capability. He has to be capable of inspiring others without actually sitting on top of them with a check, which is management, not leadership. Now, that's a good distinction, but. I'm not sure if I buy all of that because that makes it sound as if it kind of diminishes the value of management, doesn't it? That's just sitting on people's checklists. I think there's more to management too. I think management is also a very noble and, and necessary and, and uh, you know, something we have to do. We've got an organization, we've got a lot of pieces. It has to be managed. Okay? And the system has to be managed. So I would, I would disagree a little bit, but there's a nice distinction. But so now let's think about this. Um, on Thursday, I was with Bill on him thinking primary. Anybody here attended that before? Yeah, a lot of folks. And I learned some language there. And we've got different kinds of thinking that we can do. Thinking which chunks things into categories, right? Category thinking versus continuity thinking. Continuum thinking. Leadership versus management sounds pretty much like a category thinking, doesn't it? You're either one or the other. Well, I don't really think that's the case. Um, leadership, management. Leadership, vision. Have the vision for the organization. That's as, as leadership extreme as you can get, right? We're talking about big picture, long range, system. What are we going to be when we grow up? What's the purpose of this organization? What is the aim of this organization? Once you've got a vision, you have to translate that into an aim. I think vision is more visionary. What do we, you know, but aim is more specific in my thinking. And now that we've got a vision with you know, an aim, like the, that's the intermediate five year, ten year kind of thing we're thinking about. Create a system. You have to create. And maybe if you already inherited an organization, you're going to have to refine or redefine or recreate. But creating a system, I think you're moving towards management with this. Creating a system, you have to have the idea, you have to have an implementation plan, you have to figure out who's going to do it, you've got to come up with the money to get it done, right? There's some, there's some management activity. It's a lot of like leadership activity, management activity. Now, we're going to have to, with this new aim or an aim and vision, unless you're a solo, you know, you're going to do this on your own, you're going to make this company happen in your garage and you're the only worker, you're the visionary and the doer. Unless that's the case, you're going to have to come up with others to, to help you with, with accomplishing this. So we have to acquire, entice folks to, you know, join your vision with you and join you and then develop their talents towards that vision. That's, that's a leadership, but also a management function. And then define the method, specifically how we do these things. And then apply those methods within the system to deliver whatever it was that you decided was your aim. On behalf of who? Any, any organization that is going to either be a profit or not-for-profit, they exist 
for some reason that usually involves the bagel. Well, yeah, but the first person you got to please is who? The exactly. Yeah. On on Deming out of uh, page four. Um, that was one important thing. Consumers. They're within the system, and you got to please them. So. All right. So I'm thinking this is more continuum thing. We got we got to think in terms of a continuum. So leadership and management, there's some things you got to do to get things going. But there's more to this as well. After you put <coughs> the systems to deliver, now you're, you're delivering, right? You need to manage and recognize when you need to make adjustments, right? That's, that's a management function, isn't it? You've got to monitor what's going on and understand how you're doing against what you were intending to do and whether or not the customers are satisfied. And, if you've got expectations with respect to delivery times or um, quality or et cetera. And then once you recognize the need for adjustment, another function that you have to take on is to build teams who will be capable of doing plan, do, study, act kinds of improvement on the methods. Because the, the methods are what got us those results, right? And then you've got to encourage and develop your manager's abilities, so that they can do that. You might need to recognize <coughs> you've got, you've got methods. Methods are kind of the front end of what's going on. What about those systems? Those systems might not be serving you properly. And so then you're going to need to recognize the need for system adjustments. Now, who owns the systems? Top management, right? They're the only ones who can work on it. So that means, well, there's still some management functionality within recognizing the need for system adjustments and doing something about it. There's some project management kinds of stuff built in there. And then develop and foster the culture of continual improvement within this organization. Now we're way back over on the left hand side. So leadership management, that's interesting. I think it's really all one big continuum. And as I was thinking about this, I also thought about something else. We've got management, we sometimes talk about the people on the left. We also talk about top leadership, right? We use that term somewhat interchangeably for the folks on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we got management. But we also sometimes talk about like a team leader, right? So we get the concept of the, that the very front end of a team model is there, right? Right in the middle, we always say what? Middle Middle management. Yeah, have you ever heard of middle leadership? <laughs> I never have. <laughs> I've never heard that term. I think we need middle leadership too. But we don't ever talk about middle leadership for some reason. I don't know. So leadership versus management. Now, if we want to have a method for doing all this, John's talk was great. He listened to a bunch of things that you need to think about as you're doing this. But a method, a practical method, step by step. We've got this kind of the front end stuff, the vision, translating that into an aim, and you know, finding and finding methods to, to kind of get that. There's kind of this front end stuff we gotta do. You gotta have a method for that. And then we got this kind of the, you know, apply methods within the systems to deliver and recognize need for adjustment. There's kind of the day-to-day -day run of the business. We, we probably need a method or multiple methods for that, right? And then we get this kind of like uh, teams, capability of TDSA and encouragement of managers to, to be able to do that and recognize when we have to. There, there's something around that as, as well. So I think there's some, there's some, regions, some zones, where we need to come up with some methods, OK? All right. Well, if we want to do that, and we want to keep those principles from Dr. Deming in mind, let's think a little bit more about that. Inside of the center is the kind of the high level, vision for this system of front out, system variations like how many know. Around the outer edge are a few key words of things I think about. Um, as I was mentioning, I, I did this early work with Dr. Deming. I got super turned on on all this. <coughs> I was going to systems thinking and action conferences in Boston. I was 
uh, studying you know, David Bohm dialogue stuff, and I was doing all these uh, interesting things. Pursued a master's in statistics, did lots of experiments, and, and learned a lot about all this. The things I take away, appreciation for a system, that has to do with the aim, making sure you have an aim that constitutes a problem when you don't have a system. The concept of interaction, interaction between pieces. This is not, um, you work on one thing independent of something else and, and set them both off in, in a direction to improve and that improves the system. No, it might not. There's optimization and sub-optimization, there's delays. And alignment, if you want to work on improving a system to get multiple people involved, you got to get them aligned so that they understand what they're trying to accomplish. So that, those are some things I think about. Psychology, of course, is all about people, which means it's about motivation. And understand the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, and understanding how people can become demotivated and how to avoid that. It includes change, it includes trust, and something that I picked up. Um, anybody go to the um, the section, the, the course uh, in the pre-work, uh, what we're learning about the brain? Anybody go there? Yeah, I, I, I went to that last year, and. I, and it all fits, and I added that last point here, visual methods. Some people say, oh, I'm a visual thinker, and other people say, you know, maybe they haven't thought about it yet. We're all visual thinkers. Every human is a visual thinker. So visual methods is an important part of psychology and what we should consider with respect to our mind. Variation. Of course, the use of statistics, understanding data, understanding the difference between common and special causes of variability, Understanding that there's this concept of stability, and if you have stability, you've got some degree of predictability, and that that's a useful thing to have as a starting point for, you know, jumping off points for improvement. The difference between all analytic and enumerative studies, and when you understand all that, understand the various kinds of mistakes that can easily be made in order to avoid making them. And theory of knowledge, which uh, as uh, Kevin Cahill was talking about, it seems impenetrable at first, but it's really just about learning. How do you learn? How do organizations learn? How do people learn? The concept of plan, B, study, act, cycle, having operational definitions and, and learning and improvement. That's what that's about. So now, we get everything we need. We get that model of, of the continuum of leadership and the key tasks that are to be done, and we've got a organizing principle, sort of. So let's think about this a little bit more and see if there's anything we can distill from it. And the key ideas I'm going to talk about is that SOPK plus some logic can yield some principles for implementation. Practical application requires clear and reliable methods. And this is where I think a lot of folks break down in this whole thing. They say, too much in the thinking about and not enough in the doing about. And the doing about is getting it really straightforward and simple. A coherent set of methods for an organization constitutes a management system. So what we have to do is come up with a management system. And those methods apply to the leaders as well as to their teams. I've been interacting with lots of top leaders and I've had some tremendous successes and I've had some lesser successes and I've had some fling offs. And when I've been successful has been when leaders understood that this concept applies directly to them and their work. And when I've been less successful, the top leadership thought, oh yeah, this is good, but it's for them. Yeah. So that's a key idea. All right. So if you take Deming's insights, the SOPK and uh, Add some logic to it and think about it. Then there's a little bit more here. You can come up with some principles. First one, to improve results, you have to work upstream on the process. Okay? If you want results, you can't concentrate there. You won't get it. There's, there's a paradox there. You have to work on the process to get the results. Further upstream leads, leads or uh, results in uh, higher leverage. So if you want to improve all the that just creates a chain reaction, of lower cost, higher productivity, higher profits. You gotta have a method, PSA, and you spend on the repeating cycle, okay? And as you, over time, you go up a, a hill and you get better and better. 
And from psychology, there are three conditions that allow change. And the first time I heard this, it was from Peter Schultz a long time ago. And I honestly don't know where he got it, so I'm not sure the origin of that. Three conditions that allow change. First condition is that people feel good about themselves. That sounds a little odd. What does that have to do with allowing change? Well, change requires people to have some confidence that they can do it. Right? If they are fearful, if they live in, in fear of failure, they won't want to do it. If they just generally lack the skills and, and confidence that they could be successful, they won't want to do it. So you have to create an environment where people feel good and they're ready for this challenge. The change has to involve your ideas. So you, you know, telling them what to do isn't necessarily a good idea. And the change needs to involve their motivation. So there's some, some principles. The practical application I want to talk about is one that I learned when I was at Toyota. They've taken this model, and they really have. This is, they were uh, the picture. Um, anybody go to Kevin Cahill's presentation today? So you saw a picture of in 1950, Dr. Deming in a room, and they were uh, talking. He talked about 80% uh, the, the, the industrialists that were in that room represented 80% of the capital of Japan. It was the top, it's like the CEOs of all the top companies. Aichi Toyoda was in the room, and he took it to heart. And I think there's a very close correlation between what's come to be known as Toyota production system, some people call it lean, and these ideas. I don't think there's, they're not very far apart in my opinion. So that first part at the top, the long term, year by year kind of visioning stuff, they have a name for a methodology. There's a Japanese word for it, but I call it strategy deployment. So that's a practical application on the top. There's a short-term daily management system, and then there's the development of people, which happens through something called leader standards work. So I'm going to talk about this. So how many folks in the room have attempted to apply this sort of the production system in your own organization? Anybody working on applying it? Just one? Thanks for five. That was many folks. No, no, the, the thing, strategy deployment, data management, and anybody heard these terms? Or you know, just, I'm, just, I'm trying to gauge how different is this from where you're coming from or how similar you are. It sounds like not so much on the similarity side. Which, that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. Okay. So, here's my way of looking at this and translating where things come from and how they relate. So I'm going to ex explain my thinking. I want to find out if it makes sense to you, and kind of show you how I see these things all fit together. So on this idea, the front part of that, you know, kind of the leadership management continuum and the visioning, and let's figure out what we're trying to do around here, what the long-term future is, there's this method called strategy deployment for that. And I think the domains of systems <laughs> that are involved are primarily the appreciation for system and theory of knowledge piece. I think that's the dominant piece. It's got the aim piece, and it's got the plan to study acts by piece. That's the predominant um, what, axis of this, of this system. It also involves both people and motivation and change. So there's some of that. And within variation, common special causes, you have to have a knowledge of that. So this one is kind of, you've got to have a pretty good understanding of the whole thing. And I think those are the pieces that, that uh, are important. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to kind of take you through what this thing is, if you haven't seen it before. And some people have probably seen it, but didn't quite get it. And I think there's some nuances that people may not be aware of. So let me share with you a practical example, a method for implementing with that in mind. And then we'll see what kind of questions you have on that. So first, strategy deployment, it can be confused with strategy creation. Uh, I told you I went to get a degree in business, and I became one of those guys who was practicing the, um, the current uh, prevailing style of management. And that's when I met them right after I graduated. I asked them a few questions, and I've got some kind of quick rebuke kind of answers that 
Well, I sort of think about this a little bit. Uh, one of those was strategy. So I studied strategy, and so I have a master's degree in strategy. Uh, so I thought I'd do something about that. Well, most companies in the West have, if they're a bigger company, they've got a big job, they've got an office of strategy. And they worry about what should our strategy be. <coughs> and they spend a lot of time and they do all kinds of things to come up with the strategy. And then they roll out the strategy which means they tell people it's strategy. And then they leave it up to somebody else to figure out what to do about it. And often not much happens. And then they revisit the strategy because they're not working. They miss the point that creation is different than getting something to happen about. So strategy deployment is about getting something to happen about it more than it is about creation. But you still have to create. Okay. Here's some more kind of my thinking on this. Vision aim of the organization, you know, we talked about it, you need to get that. That's important, you have to have it. And John talked about that just a little bit ago. To me, that comes from somewhere. It comes first from values. How we start to travel where we want to go, how we want to behave, guiding principles. And after you get your values in mind, you have to understand, well, who are our customers we're trying to serve? So, and you know, external, and if you're worrying about um, a service organization, somebody that's internal, you might have <coughs> But from your customers, then you can figure out what your mission is. Okay, what are we trying to do? Okay, and what must we do to satisfy the needs of our customers? So values with an understanding of customers leads to a mission, and with that in mind, you can create a vision or aim of the organization. So there you go. You've got that. Then you have to do a reality check. Well, where are we right now relative to that vision or aim? And that creates the, the tension between those two things creates a gap. Okay. There's a difference between your aim, where you want to be, and where you are today. With that gap in mind, then it makes sense to establish some goals of what we want to do next. Milestones we expect to reach before too long is what we have to do to make progress towards that vision. That all makes sense, everybody? Okay. So, there's some relationships. So, <coughs> understand where we are, gap, goal. This idea of strategy deployment is based on a premise that once you've got some goals, they're organizational goals, and it's possible, if the goal's on the left-hand side, that you can figure out what are the means to achieve that goal. There might be multiple means. And then once you understand those means, you can think of those means instead as, as sub-goals. And then what are the means to achieve that? And you can, you can keep breaking it down. So here's, reductionist you know, thinking here. One fault with this visualization is that it looks like they're all independent and there are crossovers, right? So I left that off, but I didn't, I, I'm not unaware that you have to think about that. Th this is just an explanation of what this strategy deployment thing, how it works. Another thing about the strategy deployment thing, what you're trying to do is work on the alignment. That's the whole point. And typically, you've got people in their jobs, and they've got their own ideas of what's important, and they, they do whatever they do. And you take all that activity, and you do a vector sum of all the activity in the organization, and that gets you whatever you got, and it's somewhere going towards the aim or not. And strategy deployment is all about alignment. Get all the people in their jobs going in the same direction, pulling in the same direction, such that when they add them up, it moves you more rapidly towards the, the organization's goal. And that's important, but it's also even more important because this presumes things are kind of static. And actually, there's often a change in the environment. And on a regular basis, you need to have the opportunity to make an adjustment. And that adjustment has to be such that everybody gets it. And, and so that's what this is about at a very high level. And how does it work? Well, this is a big picture flowchart. The Japanese word for strategy deployment is hoshinkan. Hoshinkan. A hoshin is kind of like a, that's an innovation, okay? So hoshinkanri is about discontinuous improvement towards an innovation needed for a long-term improvement. That's what this is about. So you have a long-term vision plan, you got a 
environmental change, and you had the midterm plan, last year's plan, the president with maybe a strategic plan kind of person, they do some diagnosis, and from that comes annual oceans. What are the big picture things we need to accomplish this year to move us in the direction of the aim we've got as a company? And the stuff in the top left that's proactive, you do that before you start this, and all the rest of this is kind of like an annual process you use to manage it, okay? So then the plan do check act or plan do study act by goals, you start with these annual oceans, you do a deployment of them, and then you basically have projects you manage them through the year, and you, that's all the reactive stuff on the bottom. You, you make adjustments, course corrections. So let's talk about how you actually do that. Um, we end up with annual oceans that look like numerical <laughs> goals, right? In fact, they are. And so you might say, well, numerical goals, you're not supposed to do those. Well, no, you're not supposed to do them in, in the absence of having a method for how to achieve them. So this is a numerical goal based on a diagnosis of what's been happening in the environment relative to our competitors, relative to our market share, relative to our financial position, uh, and re recognizing where we've in years past had difficulties and a focus area where we want to make an innovation and make a big change. So the president's ocean might be reduce costs 20%. But it's not just by 20%. It has a vision or an idea of where you're going to get that by decreasing the length of the business cycle, perhaps. And what happens is then each of the leaders of, and there are, you know, even though it's a system, there are still departments with uh, specialized expertise, and there are leaders of those departments, and they've got a, a, a role to play in this. And here's the key. This is what is missing from most folks' understanding. The way that this works is each of the leaders of these areas think to themselves, all right, if we're going to get this improvement by reducing costs and decreasing the length of business cycle, what does my department, what part does my department play in whatever that is? And what is currently preventing me <coughs> or preventing my department from being able to deliver on that? So what prevents achievement of that? Manufacturing is an unresponsive procurement and inventory system. Administration finance, unnecessary approvals and sales, qualified prospects, unexpectedly declined to purchase at the last minute. Marketing, each of the product requires a new effort to line up secure for development. Products that meet product specifications aren't accepted by data test customers. So those are the, the judgment of, of these guys. What, what's the issue for them? Ah, in that tree diagram thing. So now they've got a goal. They have to figure out what they need to do about that because it, the, the thinking goes, these things taken together will lead to an organizational change. Now, there's, there's a step we're going to get to that may not be the case. Some of these might work against each other, right? So we're going to come to that. Hold that thought. <laughs> All right. So those are the reasons why, over here, what might they do for their functional ocean? Okay? And they come up with the things that they might do in order to address the, the cause that they've got. Okay? And then this goes on. So this is the, at the VP level. And then at the, at the uh, director level, there might be, you know, that would slow down again. Sales decrease average by 30% by decreasing and improving uh, those, uh, uh, reducing qualified to don't buy by improved product selection. Make sure you're choosing the right ones with the, you know, matches uh, and improving sales support, et cetera, et cetera. So this flows down this way. But now let's think about this. It might be the case these things don't add up. And here's another thing that folks don't understand about this process. Um, the Japanese uh, learned baseball right after World War II, and they love baseball. And they like sports analogies just like we do. And so they have a sports analogy for what they do next. And it's called catch ball. And so this is, you know, you're warming up before the game, and what, what all the players do, they're just catching, right? And what this is talking about is, I got this idea, and I'm going to talk to you. Let's, let's talk. Does that make sense to you? How does that impact you? And so, you know, at the VP level, they're, they're checking across, and they're checking down with their people, and they're actually checking across 
uh, you know, the VP manufacturing is making sure that the thing that they're working on doesn't affect the director of uh, sales. Okay? And so there's cross departmental and cross uh, hierarchical uh, interactions to ensure that we don't have some optimization going on. And they'll make adjustments as required. And then here's another key piece of this method, recognizing the idea of PDSA, of thinking, of um, visual. They have um, a very simple approach for gathering the thoughts. So, so each of those little squares or rectangles there, that's sort of the plan. In the plan, they use a, an A3, it's called. Anybody heard of A3 before? Yeah. So an A3, all that is, is a metric size of paper. It's about the size of an 11 by 17. That's all it is. It's just a big sheet of paper. Um, and, and it's very simple. You know, by the department, what are the performance <coughs> gaps and targets? What the, the cause analysis for what our, our gap is with respect to this thing we're trying to achieve? What's the rationale? So this is sort of the theory. And then what is the specific plan? What are we going to do? What are the metrics? What would a target date? And what kind of follow-up on resolved issues might we have? And so you establish a very simple plan. But this is the result of a lot of work, right? There's one sheet of paper that distills down for, with respect to the one motion, what we're going to do in order within our department to achieve on behalf of the organization that aligns with and interacts with. Okay? And then you go into a, a management cycle where you have a, a wall and you look at these things. And so now the next thing that people don't understand as well is that this is big picture PDSA. And at the end of the year, each of those, each of those boxes has one of these. And each one of those at the end of the year gets a row. What was the plan, et cetera? And I'll carry on. Highlights, what was the implementation plan, title of summary, but these are key points. Over here, there's a judgment of how did we do at the end of the year. There's two columns. One column is labeled activity, the other label is result. Okay? The top one was green, green. The activity was good and we got the result we want. So we carried out the plan consistent with what we had said at the beginning of the year, and it looks like our theory was pretty good because it worked out. You can have green red down here. Hey, we carried out the activity, but we didn't get the result. What does that mean? Probably you didn't have the right idea. You know, we carried out the plan, just like we said we were going to. It didn't work. You know, here on the right-hand side, it says comment and action. Plan, do, study, act. What do we interpret from that? And action, what should, you know, recommendation for the next year plan, what should we do different? Abandon, adjust, whatever. So you can have red, red, we didn't, we didn't do it, and it didn't happen. Uh, you could, it says red, yellow, didn't do anything, but it came out kind of okay, or got lucky, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering about that. Is that kind of what that implies? Is yeah. Because the um, method was th This is it. real. This is real. I, I did this in 2005. Oh, like, oh. Been, uh, we meant to use this chemical, we accidentally used this chemical, as it turns out, the surface finish was better than we that, that would be a micro version of this. Right. This is more of a, a, yeah, a bigger picture. Level, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's what that's all about. There is a method to apply to take this vision stuff and deploy it into the organization and get people working on things in an aligned way and in a way that doesn't overwhelm the system. You can only observe some of these and in a way that re allows you to reflect on and improve for the next year. So... Does that kind of make sense? So there, there's a method. Midterm plan environmental analysis, PDSA at the top. That's PDSA number two, direction improvement. That's the ocean management or strategy deployment. The next piece down, though, as we as we looked at that, you know, leadership and management and, and coming down at that angle, you get down to actually running the business. Well, we have to also run the business and deliver, right? So there's this thing down here at the bottom, which is data management. In dating management, there's two things going on. There's SDSA, standardized do study act. Standard, you're just trying to maintain things, okay? Just keep things going, because we're not working on this at this time. And sometimes as you study, something goes wrong, right? 
and get a problem or opportunity with them. And if you do, if it is a usual, as in not strategic problem, then you go into PDSA 1, incremental improvement. So day by day, we monitor, and sometimes we have to do something, we'll do a little study and we'll fix it. And it could be not really improvement, it could just be getting back to where you should have been, or it could be an opportunity and, and you actually make a small improvement. Okay? However, sometimes through daily operations, you find something really going wrong and you can't make sense of it. It turns out it's a strategic thing, and you actually you plan for a bigger, bigger change for next year's ocean. Okay, so this just allows for greater. So you got the two things now: strategy deployment is the big picture, longer term, and the daily. But they're they're related. There's there's again, it's a continuum. Okay, so daily management, the day to day stuff, I think is primarily theory of variation and the theory of knowledge psychology. So it's, it's planning, study, act cycles, and people, motivation, and change, and it's also recognizing the data and understanding what's going on. All right, leader standard work, I said, is what you need to do to improve the system's capability of improving. So to improve your people, et cetera. So I think that's on this, on this uh, axis here. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit more about this. Data management system, there's a wide range of views on this, and uh, I didn't mention, by the way, I, I've been doing healthcare consulting, and I've been working uh, with a company in Joan Allman and Associates since uh, a woman who's been doing this in, since the mid-90s. And this is the approach that we've been advocating in a healthcare environment. But it, it would apply anywhere. You need to have, as part of the system element, you need to have some metrics, you need to know what's going on. You need to have some standardized work. You need to have a definition of how things are done. You need to have the ability to recognize on a daily basis, are we ready for today? Because a lot of things get in the way of being ready. And when they do, you have to fix them. You need to have the concept of a schedule. There's another word up there, TAC. It refers to TAC time. And that's actually not a Japanese word, that's a German word. Um, but the idea of the cadence, the pace to work, to, to meet the requirements of uh, seeing all the patients you need to see, getting all the tests run in the lab, all that sort of stuff. And there's some foundational things here. Mindset is the first one. The idea of having uh, a, a desire, a need for improvement, just you're going to do it. The ability for the leadership and work coaching, problem solving, visual system, and the idea of encouraging improvement ideas. So, I have a little time. All right, a little bit more about this. Success metrics. The idea here is you talk through what metrics you need to uh, measure how you're doing along the dimensions that align with this system level output that you need. So you have alignment with the organization's aims. So you have identified metrics that you will track because these are the things you can influence here that if you do well, you'll be contributing to the achievement of the team. And you look at things, both result metrics, but also daily and process metrics. And leader standard work here is routinely knowing how you're doing, engaging with the folks that are there, and coach and support performance of the people who are carrying out the, the work that they do. When you find a problem, it might be simple. It might be simple, but it might not be. And there's another kind of A3 thinking. A3 thinking for planning your study act on a daily management basis. This is another method. This concept of just having a basic expectation for the thinking process that you want people to go through when they find a problem in order that they, you know, apply good thinking. And so there's training involved and all, but here you got a neonatal intensive care unit, daytime provider efficiency, and there's a problem there where they got uh, the, the census has gone up, they got a lot of people, and they don't have enough people to, to uh, handle all the volume. You break down the problem using appropriate tools, Pareto diagrams, or uh, perhaps a, you know, just a tree diagram. And as a result of understanding that, set a target for what we want to do to get back on, on task or whatever. 
Uh, look for causes that you want to investigate, and with that in mind, develop and implement some countermeasures against those causes, and then check the results. Plan, do, study, act, okay? And then summarize and follow up. And all you do is provide some training, provide some coaching, and provide them a piece of paper and a pencil, okay? This is not like intended to be computer intensive, and, and you don't you want to minimize all of the, you know, the resistance to doing this. Make it easy. And with a little bit of time and coaching and understanding, it doesn't take that long to, to do this. And so daily management is understanding what's going on, and when you're off track, understanding how to get back on track. Readiness on a daily basis, are we ready for the day? Again, visual, we've got categories. Uh, method, equipment, supplies, and staff are the typical things that go along in a healthcare environment. <coughs> so you're not ready. You've got checklists, and every morning you go and see how you're doing. As for instance, if you've got uh, a um, clinic that does hematology and oncology, so you've got a bunch of kids who've got uh, leukemia and they get uh, chemo infusions, you need a chemo pump for every kid, and it's got to be clean, it's got to be complete, it's got to be there. And it turns out that there are people on the floors upstairs who can't find pumps, and they know where to go steal one at night. They go get them from the hematology and oncology department. So in the daytime, they show up, they need to go check to make sure that they got them all back. And so, I mean, it's real simple stuff, right? But just at the beginning of the day, are we ready for the day? And if not, let's make sure we're ready. And without these kind of simple things, you'd be amazed that they start the day and go looking for stuff and run around and waste time. Leader standard work. Frontline leader performs the checks of this. Leader performs tiered huddles. And the expectation is that the, the leadership of the organization is there to serve the people who do the work, right? So if there is an issue that the frontline leader can handle, they've identified the problem, and they can handle it. When they report to the tiered huddle, they say, hey, we had this issue, but I got it handled. Here's what we did. But they might say, hey, I've got this issue, and I need your help. And it's that second level tiers result of uh, uh, obligation as the director or whatever to <coughs> get that resolved quickly. Now, sometimes it goes beyond that. It goes between departments or whatever. And then you take it to the top management. Uh, and this all happens. There's a 6.45 a.m. huddle, then there's an 8 a.m. huddle, and then there's a 9 a.m. huddle. And anything that is you know, at the top management to be resolved kind of problem happens by 9 a.m. So, so you can still save the day, okay? So that's the intent of this, this system here. Standardized work. Standardized work has to do with, for those kind of things that you do a lot of. Now in manufacturing, it would be assembly operations. How do you assemble? Um, it would be defining the content, sequence, timing, and outcome needed for important work that you do a lot of. Stocking the med carts. Say it again? Stocking the med carts. Stocking the med carts. How you process and admission. How you uh, do interdisciplinary team rounding. So there's a lot of things that you do up frequently. Not a lot. Maybe in each department, we're talking about five or six of these. But for those, you've established an expectation of what is the proper way to do this. And you establish a standard for it. And you have a training matrix, and you make sure that the folks, once that's um, been identified, that you have, in fact, trained the folks to know how to do it. You follow method. There's, there's methods on this, too, right? But I'm not going there. There is a um, confirmation checklist. If you were to train somebody how to do this, here's, here's what they need to know. And then there's also a confirmation assessment board um, where the leader is expected to, on a regular basis, Go and observe and make sure that the folks understand what the role is and that there's not confusion. And in fact, it might be the case that they've made some changes and they're now doing something different. Well, they're not supposed to do that, but there might be a good reason they did, right? So there's, there's a, it's a system, okay? So common standards work, confirm audit, perform quality checks, revise it as needed, um, and high level leader to confirm, coach, and support all of that. Now, we do this plan to react over time. And as we do that, we get improved, right? So we're doing this on a regular basis. Here's the point.
and this kind of matches that, that chart I showed at the beginning. This leader standard work stream, first you upgrade the standard, you identify what it is that's different, and you train everybody to a new way, and you do this leader standard work that prevents this thing from degrading. So entropy happens, right? And leader standard work maintains that standard, and that's what prevents the improvements you did from degrading over time. <laughs> so these pieces all fit together as a system. Improvement ideas, the idea of this is we've got this reactive stuff. Sometimes people have a um, just a, a good idea. There's no problem. They've got an idea that they can make an improvement. Let's encourage that. Let's have a, a process that makes it easy for those folks to communicate that way. And schedule and cadence. This is kind of an advanced, an advanced subject. Any place where you've got an expectation to meet customer demand, and there's a time component. In manufacturing, this happens all the time. We have to deliver, you know, uh, I worked at Toyota, uh, Gershon plant. When I started there, it was car off the line every 68 seconds, and all of a sudden went to 66, and then to 64, and then to 62. And by the way, those two second increments, those were big deals. Those were big changes, right? What we're talking about in healthcare is uh, operating room. We're going to do 19 cases today. We've got uh, three rooms in operation. We've got a two hour case. We've got a one hour case, et cetera. And a little more flexibility, but We've got to turn the room. So we've got to actually get the room clean, right? And you've heard the examples. Uh, I don't know uh, if you tell me to clean the table. I don't know what it's going to be used for. Well, we know what it's going to be used for. It's going to be used for an operation. So cleaning is pretty important, OK? And so having a process metric related to time for things that are important, tracking it, OK? And then recognizing when we're doing OK and when we are not. And you also need to understand how to look at special causes, because it depends on which kind of a, a distribution you see, if it's a problem with the system or if it was a special cause, and asking the right questions. So there's there's all kinds of relationships here. Okay? We have in-process metrics. When we miss, we would understand what was the specifics, because um, anybody heard of stratification of data, stratified? Yeah, so you have to have an understanding of what else was going on. If, if you're going to do some diagnosis, you have to have some understanding, some context for the data. You have to keep, keep track of the abnormalities that were going on at the time. And when we are in the moment exceeding standard, we need to provide a means, a mechanism, for the individual who is behind to ask for help. And they should have the ability to recognize they're behind before it's caused a loss. So if they're cleaning the OR room in between uh, surgeries, and it's supposed to take 12 minutes, and they get hung up on something partway through because ran out of something or whatever, and they're at the six minute point, and they know based on what I see in front of me, I can't make my time, they need to ask for help right now. They have to have a mechanism to allow that to happen. Take the orphan, the supervisor, or whoever's designated to provide the assistance to come to what's going on. This happened. Okay, I'll take care of that. Now you get two people, and, I, and you save the you save the, the process. You don't get denied. You brought extra resources to go and do this. So these are some of the things around data metrics. So how do you do this? How do you implement? Build a team and determine what's important. Build a team. Position descriptions, roles, and responsibilities. What is important? Mission and vision, business objectives, and strategy deployment. So we've got these these systems are supporting each other. Then you have to determine how to measure what's important. You have to have some measures, okay? And that comes from target and objective, results and process, and process indicators, readiness, that readiness thing I talked about, and also catch ball, the strategy deployment thing. Then you have to create a visual system. This visual issue is huge. It's important for people to grasp what's going on. And there's a big wave of problems that's flowing across healthcare right now. It's called EMR. Anybody know what that is? Electronic medical record. Electronic medical record. Everything's going into computers now. Okay? And they've created, there's a bunch of different competing software companies that produce <laughs> software packages that you use to manage this stuff. And then they think they're so smart because then they can 
get like you know electronic whiteboards and they, they do these things that that it's intended to make it visual, right? But it's not really because you have to go over a computer and you have to like search through three things and you have to hit refresh. Uh, it's it's like it's terrible. And we're talking about real simple stuff like whiteboards with magnets. And if something goes wrong, you flip the magnet from green to red, or you put a flag on top of the the um, desk and where somebody can see it to help. And then create patterns and standard work support. Structure meeting, cross levels, and work through your standard work. Leader's primary role is for his or her team. Leader standard work maintains standardized work. Visibly board practice and leaders will basically be reviewing and understanding what's going on. And then there's a nested set of responsibilities <coughs> for leader standard work. So the frontline leader, they're managing the process and observing and confirming. That's the resource lead. A manager has leader standard work to support those frontline leaders. They do coaching and support, training, development. The director, same for their managers. And this concept, this concept is intended to be really simple, practical, and, and useful. And it, you can't really see what's in here, but what we what we recommend is a real simple, like a piece of paper, and it's a, like a trifold where you, you have the front page, you've got the, the inside piece here, and it's basically the checklist of things that you want to make a promise to yourself. I'm going to do this on behalf of my people every day, or it depends on what your role is. It might be a weekly cadence. It might be even monthly cadence of, of weekly, what you're going to do with respect to the system. And you have a leader standard work document that you maintain for yourself. So like rounding reminders? Yes. It's like rounding reminders. So you have a method that you've thought about and you keep track of your ability to do it. And you're, you don't always get it done, right? And when you don't get it done, well, why is that? Well, I had this other meeting that was called downtown or whatever. Time? All right. So what keeps this from becoming micromanagement? Becoming micromanagement. It sounds like it could become micromanagement, right? It's respect for people, mutual trust, leaders and coaches, team members that feel good about themselves, and teams that identify problems and work to solve problems based on their own ideas and motivations and alignment on that shared maturity. All right, that was it. I've got some discussion questions that if we had extra time, we we're going to get to, but we don't have any extra time. Well, I can ask questions, but I'll start by talking to Oh, okay. We have till four, don't we? No, I think we have till five. All right. Well, we, we started uh, we started 15 minutes late, and I only ran five over, so you cheated me out of 10 minutes. Okay, well, I'm <laughs> 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 I was on time. The learners are being cheated out of 10 minutes. Uh, this, is well, a, this is a great time. <laughs> are there any questions? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Question. Uh, you have spent time with Dr. Dennis. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I like this concept of systems, but systems are all parts of a bigger system and a bigger system. Yes, yes. How do we stop the scope of so, making um, the systems bigger and bigger and bigger? Yeah. Or why don't we, in certain cases, because yeah. we could prevent war <laughs> if you really look at it that way. Yes, and uh, it's a very good question. And I think it's, it's purely a practical matter related to bandwidth and capability of the people who are trying to do the management of the system. Because as systems uh, increase in scope, they increase in complexity. And uh, systems, um, the complexity goes up uh, in a geometric way based on the number of interactions. So it's a geometric increase in complexity. And it, became, it can become overwhelming. And so, uh, it's purely a practical matter. Start at a smaller system level off the boundary of your level of responsibility. When you've got a system that appears to be somewhat in control, not wildly out of control, you can then expand to incorporate you know, key customers and suppliers perhaps, and then maybe regulatory body, and then maybe com you know, community, and then uh, national. And so it, it is purely 
a function in my mind of what we have the capacity to deal with. Yes? Yeah, I, I'm just curious as to why you chose some of the terms to describe things in the CCA. Such as? Well, for instance, strategy deployment. Yes. I've always known that as a tactical plan. Okay, so you have a strategic plan and a tactical plan. And the metrics that you described there, you know, we usually refer to those in most of the companies I work for as scorecards and dashboards. You know, so you have the strategic.